Hello everyone, this is Professor Philip Travis, and this week in Warren Society, as we start our, 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 our second test section, we're going to be looking at the Second World War. Um, and uh, in terms of our assignments for this week, uh, we're going to have a discussion forum. That'll be all. Remember, two posts, one reply, or I'm sorry, one post, two replies over two separate days um, with substantial use of the assigned materials and with respect to replies to classmates uh, to earn full credit. Um, our readings this week will be found in PDF form, and you'll, of course, find them in modules, so you don't have to worry about uh, looking anywhere else this week for your readings. Uh, we're going to be looking at the Second World War, and this is a perfect place to begin this portion of the class because the Second World War is a really critical moment, of course, in American history. It is the moment that gives rise to the United States truly as... Uh, as 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 a world hegemonic power, uh, it is the Second World War. Its aftermath, the Cold War, that really um, has a fundamental um, role in transforming um, American society in terms of how Americans view their place in the world, their role in the world, how its role in the world changes American society. Uh, we're going to be looking at that. Um, significantly, and this is uh, in depth, and we'll be looking at this in weeks ahead as we get to the Cold War, and then of course as we look at the 60s, Vietnam, and we start reading that text, The Republic of Rock, uh, by Michael Kramer, and we look at how um, the, the 60s and the Vietnam War and music um, shaped and really was a defining force uh, of Americans experiencing uh, service in Vietnam and Americans sort of attempting to redefine citizenship and, and the meaning of America at home uh, in the United States as part of the so-called counterculture. So we're going to look at World War II here. And of course, pictured you see Winston Churchill right here with Franklin Roosevelt, American President Franklin Roosevelt, the only president of the United States to serve four terms. Uh, he did not, of course, complete his fourth term. He was elected to his fourth term only um, to tragically die um, in office at the outset of his term in April of 1945. Um, he, of course, was then his vice president, Harry Truman, then took over. Um, and, of course, by the way, the amendment to the Constitution of the United States that the president should only serve two terms uh, is generally associated with the result of Roosevelt's four terms. Roosevelt was the president through the height of the Great Depression from 1933 uh, until... Usually people associate the end of the Great Depression with uh, the beginning of the Second World War, though um, uh, the exact date of the end of the Depression might be uh, up for a level of debate. And then, of course, Roosevelt was um, uh, president during uh, the overwhelming majority of the Second World War. Uh, when he passed, tragically, uh, the result of the war was really was really... Um, established and the United States, it was just a matter of the end game um, in the war. Though, of course, Roosevelt would never have known that the atomic bomb, which we'll be looking at um, next week in this class, uh, Roosevelt would never have known that the atomic bomb was or was not successful because the first successful test of that weapon occurred in July of 1945. So, just a discussion forum this week. Um, uh, Readings are in PDF this week. I will get your exams graded soon. It might take me a week, but I will be working on them all week, and I'll get them graded as soon as I can. I look forward to, to reading them and grading them. Um, the factoid for this week, remember, post this in the Extra Credit Discussion Forum by um, the end of the day, Wednesday, to receive credit for this. The factoid is this. Um, Roosevelt, who was really a... Um, Roosevelt was really himself kind of an international thinking individual. Uh, but Roosevelt, when he was president, had to really struggle against and recall from the reading and the study that we looked at with World War I, Roosevelt really had to struggle against um, uh, the force of isolationism in the United States. Um, isolationism, of course, was this political perspective, a foreign policy perspective, that was born really out of the First World War. Um, it was a new term, a new idea. Um, as we, we, we read, uh, uh, as George Herring uh, explained in the readings, um, it was a term that really emerged as a result of um, the First World War and this new sort of um, 
role that the United States uh, was to assume, potentially, as a world power um, after as a result of its involvement, really for the first time ever, in a major cross-Atlantic overseas conflict. And so we, we talked about some of the different uh, perspectives that emerged. You had conservative internationalists, you had progressive internationalists, and then, of course, emerged isolationists. During the 1930s, the isolationists were really the dominant force um, driving perspectives in American foreign policy. And Roosevelt himself was really an internationalist, um, wasn't really an isolationist, but Roosevelt really had to struggle against the reality of isolationism during um, the 1930s as Americans sought to disengage from international uh, affairs and focus most on fixing the depression the economic crisis going on in the 1930s at home and to focus on it nationally by itself. What this meant was that when World War II developed, when it occurred, when it started to occur, the United States was woefully underprepared for the Second World War. And, and for a, a great many Americans, um, terribly unwilling to become involved in another European conflict. Many Americans viewed World War I in the 1930s as a mistake, as something the United States should have never have gotten into. Uh, many Americans uh, would have interpreted World War I as a war that um, the United States got involved in because of the power of armament manufacturers selling weapons that pulled the United States into the war. And so many Americans saw the First World War as sort of... Um, uh, a war that the United States should never have gotten into, and you saw isolationism becoming a dominant force um, driving uh, the political realities of the United States. The United States in the latter 30s, as Nazi Germany was rearming, threatening its neighbors, as it was, uh, as it was militarizing the Rhineland, reoccupying other areas, annexing Austria, threatening Czechoslovakia, and then ultimately taking um, uh, Czechoslovakia following the granting of the Sudetenland, as a result of the Munich Conference. As all that was happening, the United States really, in no way, shape, or form, uh, moved to prepare uh, to potentially fight a war against Nazi Germany. Instead, the United States was doing things like it passed a debt default act, the Johnson Debt Default Act, um, in which it asserted that it would not it would not loan anything to a warring European power unless said powers like Great Britain had paid all of their debts from the First World War. The United States asserted itself as a neutral power and passed multiple neutrality acts, asserting it would not become involved in a meaningful sense. To make a long story short, of course, by 1939, Roosevelt begins to slowly sort of, through his so-called fireside chats, his radio chats, his radio talks that he gave for the American people, Roosevelt, he used these talks to inform the American people his fireside chats, and he began working to convince the American people that the United States had to become involved in uh, helping, particularly uh, the British uh, and the French in uh, the war with Germany. In 1939, the United States, um, the United States traded some World War One destroyers, 50 of them, to uh, the British for some overseas bases. Um, in the Atlantic. And in 1940, it begins so-called cash carry, saying, we'll sell you stuff, but you have to pay for it up front, uh, which was never going to work. And by 1941, the United States finally uh, began the, the famous Lend-Lease program, which was really, which began in March of 1941. Lend-Lease was really an assertion that the United States was now becoming meaningfully involved in, uh, in fighting Nazi Germany. Um, though, of course, it's not until December 7th, 1941, that the United States um, enters the war as a combatant power formally. Anyway, the point is, is that, th and this is the gist of the factoid, isolationism left the United States woefully under underprepared for, um, for, for the war in Europe. And because of that, um, of course, the United States, even when the United States believed it, it had to become involved, it was unable to really stop uh, the scale of destruction, uh, the absolutely horrifying level of destruction in Europe, the catastrophe of the, of the Holocaust, the United States was unable to stop that even after it began mobilizing 
by 1941 um, because uh, it was so underprepared that um, when these things started to happen, uh, the United States, it, it took a long time for it to mobilize, and this was a result of the philosophy of isolationism. And the factoid is, so today when you see the United States really strongly behind NATO, really strongly behind its allied powers in the world, the United States maintaining a large military budget and really involve around the world as an as a, as a engaged global power, that is a result of its failure, really, from the 1930s, its isolationism of the 1930s, because American policy makers, uh, particularly in the Cold War and beyond, looked at what happened in the 30s and said, never again. Never again can the United States sit on the sidelines unprepared, watching a potentially aggressive authoritarian power threatening um, uh, you know, peaceful parts of the world, shall we say. Um, and so the, these were the so-called lessons of Munich, were that you can't appease a potentially belligerent, aggressive power in the way that had occurred with Nazi Germany in the lead up to World War II. And so the lessons of Munich meant for the United States that the United States had to be prepared. It had to be ready to engage. It had to be involved in the world. It had to build alliances. It had to do things to protect its security and the security of, 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 of its allies in the world. And so that's really the factoid, is the lessons of Munich, which are really a, a critique of the failure of isolationism in American, um, in American foreign policy and the importance of the United States as a world power to understand its role as a world power. And of course, we know that its role as a world power, um, it's made mistakes as a world power. And uh, there are conflicts and things the United States has been involved in that... Um, absolutely d d should be criticized and we should learn from those types of, of of mistakes in the period after World War II. But the overarching lesson that the United States should be globally prepared, engaged, supporting its allies and prepared to prevent uh, an event like uh, the Second World War, um, that lesson is really the overarching lesson driving um, uh, America's sort of role in the world today. So that's the factoid. Uh, let's have a great week. I'll see everyone in the discussion forum. I'll get working on those tests soon.